So I've been looking for something more positive to talk about. And just this week, well, day before yesterday, they announced the Nobel Prize in Physics for this year. Uh, and also th this morning they announced the prize in Chemistry, which was also something uh, that I find interesting. But the prize in Physics in particular is something that I know a thing or two about. So I thought that would be something good to discuss that's a bit more uh, positive than uh, a lot of the goings on in the world at the moment. Um, and the prize announcement does a decent job of explaining sort of what they're giving the prize for, uh, but uh, the actual experiments that they're awarding the prize sort of associated with uh, kind of uh, get into some more nitty gritty things that I thought it'd be good to discuss both. So they gave out the prize for uh, the official line, which if I read it is uh, for a series of experiments to demonstrate the bizarre quantum properties of the uh, or the bizarre properties of the quantum world made concrete in a system big enough to be held in the hand, which is more or less is correct. Um, so they did experiments on something that I have been interested in my entire career, which is sort of macroscopic manifestations of quantum mechanical effects. And when we say macroscopic, uh, we don't really mean like, you know, you can hold them in the palm of your hand, right? But we mean going from typical quantum mechanical scales, which are on the order of nanometers or angstroms, which an angstrom is one tenth of a nanometer, so one ten billionth of a meter. Uh, and these are experiments that are typically on the scale of, you know, uh, hundreds of microns up to a few millimeters. So still relatively small, right? But bear in mind, one micrometer is a thousand nanometers and one millimeter is a thousand micrometers. And we're talking about things that are existing on the scale of millimeters. So, you know, quite literally a million times larger than we would typically see for a quantum system. Uh, and they can be extended out to scales of centimeters. Um, so large enough that you could actually see it with the naked eye, right? And so the particular experiments that they did uh, are mostly on things called Josephson junctions. And Josephson junctions are, they're a form of something called quantum tunneling that the prize announcement does a, you know, decent little diagram of here, right? That uh, there are certain situations where the classically, right, if you try to throw a ball over a wall like that and uh, you know you don't throw it high enough it'll just hit the wall and bounce back uh, but quantum mechanically there is some probability of it just passing right through um, there's uh, honestly a couple of problems with that diagram right there which i'll explain why that's not quite uh, the right way to look at it but uh, you know to for a for a news announcement it's actually pretty decent um so uh, there's lots of manifestations of quantum tunneling, right? Um, the problem with that diagram is that it's sort of imagining like, oh, you know, if you threw the ball higher, it would uh, pass right over. But uh, it's more like rolling a ball up a hill. Uh, and if it uh, doesn't have enough energy to pass over uh, the top, it'll just roll back down. But quantum mechanically, there's a probability it'll just sort of spontaneously pass over the top, uh, right? And in this case, it's sort of throwing it at the wall. Um, it's not terrible, though. So um, common situation is in things like uh, alpha decay, where a uh, helium nucleus will spontaneously tunnel uh, out of a larger nucleus and will be emitted as a radioactive particle. And that's a manifestation of quantum tunneling down at the uh, nuclear scale, which is even smaller than the atomic scale. The atomic scale is typically on the order of angstroms, or 10 to the minus 10 meters, 1 10 billionth of a meter, uh, Nuclear scales are typically femtometers, um, right? Which a femtometer is 10 to the minus 15 meters, which is one one million is one million times smaller still than the atomic scale. So these Josephson junctions are, they're not like big, right? They're not, you know, like the size of a, a football field or something, uh, but they are large enough that you can see them with the naked eye, right? And having said that, that picture that's in the Wikipedia article here is a, a you know, it's an electron microscope image. Um, of a uh, Josephson junction uh, fabricated on a computer chip, essentially. But they are much larger, right? So this is much larger than just like a single atom. It is the size of, you know, it's 
that that thing is probably the size of a, a few human hairs, right? I think a human hair is supposed to be uh, like a cup. Uh, what is it like ten microns or something like that? I don't I don't actually remember how how large a human hair is, uh, but uh, the smallest thing that a human can see is generally about a hundred microns, and these that's about the size of these devices. So they're large enough that you can actually see them with your naked eye, and they are having manifest manifestly quantum mechanical properties. And Joseph's injunctions, what they are, is they are junctions between superconducting material and non-superconducting material. And sometimes that material is a regular conductor, sometimes it's an insulator, but it's just something that is not a superconductor. Right? And a superconductor is a state of matter that has zero electrical resistance. Um, or it, it for all intents and purposes, zero. Um, there's always, you know, another little asterisk footnote being like, well, it's not exactly zero, uh, but it is for all intents and purposes zero, and uh, in the thermodynamic limit, it would in principle be zero uh, with no defects. Uh, and so because there's no electrical resistance or functionally no electrical resistance in a superconductor, uh, it doesn't take any voltage in order to induce an electrical current, right? Normally, uh, Ohm's law says that the voltage across a material that has electrical resistance, uh, the amount of you know electrical uh, and the amount of electrical potential, uh, the amount of voltage required to drive a particular current is equal to the resistance of the object uh, times the amount of current you want to drive. Uh, for a superconductor, the amount of voltage is just zero, um, and if you take two pieces of superconductor and you put a gap between them filled with a material that it, it can be either an insulator or a conductor, as long as it's not a superconductor, right? So it can be a material that uh, doesn't conduct electricity at all, or it can be a material that conducts electricity, but it has an actual resistance to it, right? Because in a superconductor, um, you can have a current flowing without any voltage having to be applied, uh, but in a normal material uh, that if that current tries to flow, it will need a voltage, right? So what will happen is if that material C there, right, uh, if we have this junction, right, if that if that material C is, uh, is thick, right, if there's a very large gap uh, between the two sides of the super, because A and B are both superconducting here, right, if that gap is large, then you'll just have, a, you know, an, an open circuit, right? You'll just have a gap in your superconductor and uh, current just won't flow. But what happens is if you make that gap small enough, uh, and in these experiments, the gap is, you know, it's still not like, you know, the, you know, it's still not like, you know, um, 10 centimeters or anything, but it's, you know, on the order of a few microns to maybe a millimeter or so. And what you have is you have the what we call the supercurrent, which is an uncreative name for a superconduct a current in a superconductor. And the current will actually tunnel across that very thin barrier, right? Which classically it uh it's not that it can't get through at all, it's that classically you would need a voltage to get it through the barrier C, right? Again, superconductors are themselves quantum mechanical phenomena where it you have the electrical resistance drop to zero for the superconducting material so long as it is below its superconducting transition temperature. Uh, also, superconductors have a limit to how much current as well as actually how high a magnetic field they can be in. Uh, there's a limit to how high a magnetic field, how much current, and how high a temperature you can have before the material stops carrying a superconducting current. Uh, and any combination of the three going too high will make it stop being a superconductor. Uh, but as long as the material is kept below its uh, below its critical current below and below the transition temperature and the critical magnetic field, it will have a current flowing with no electrical resistance. Uh, but the gap in the middle does have an electrical resistance. And so the neat part that makes this uh, sort of Nobel Prize worthy and that makes it so that it's a sort of macroscopic manifestation of quantum tunneling is that the superconducting current, uh, which is already, uh, admittedly, is already a quantum mechanical phenomenon, but classically, it would travel with no resistance until it reaches the end of material A, and then material C it would require a voltage to get through, and then when it gets to, the, to side B, then it goes back to having no resistance. Um, but 
quantum tunneling makes it so that even even though you have a gap in the superconductor uh, filled with an insulator or a normal conductor, the supercurrent is able to quantum mechanically tunnel from one side to the other. So it just basically spontane the what happens is it's not that the supercurrent actually flows through material c it's that the supercurrent flows through material a and then it just spontaneously disappears from material a and then appears in material b because that's what quantum tunneling is i i don't want to call it teleportation because it's a it's a random process right there's not a way to make that happen but there is a way to adjust the probability of it happening but it's always going to be random uh so it's in that sense it's a bit like the infinite improbability drive from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, again, very loosely speaking, um, but it will, the supercurrent will spontaneously disappear from side A and spontaneously reappear at side B, and there's some equations that govern the probability of that happening, and as you make that gap larger and larger, the probability of it tunneling from one side to the other gets lower and lower, and of course, if the, ga if the gap has size zero, then the probability is 100%. And if the gap has size infinity, then it drops to zero, and in between it's described by this sort of exponential decay. But uh, because of the way that superconductors work, uh, there's a lot of sort of bizarre properties of uh, how that quantum mechanical tunneling will manifest. Um, but the reason that they say the prize is for... Uh, sort of a macroscopic uh, quantum mechanical phenomena is because this gap in the middle can actually be made relatively large, again, as, as quantum mechanics and these things go. Uh, and I should also say, all of these things have to be extremely cold. Uh, and that's what I've spent most of my career studying, is systems where you get them really cold, and quantum mechanical phenomena go from happening at the atomic scale to happening at the sort of, not exactly the, like, you know, the you know size of a of a person which is you know about a meter but they go from happening at atomic scales uh at room temperature of you know a nanometer to happening at scales of you know microns to tens of microns out to in some cases up to a millimeter so getting things very cold to the point where quantum mechanics will become uh, manifestly visible at scales that you could actually see with your naked eye although the way you measure the quantum mechanical properties is not uh, with the naked eye unfortunately it's not quite that straightforward but it is a very cool uh, and it is also literally cool because it has to be all of this has to be kept cold in order to work but nonetheless they have these devices where these properties of quantum mechanics that normally only happen at like extremely small scales uh, happen at scales where like you know you could just barely make this device out with your naked eye uh, and of course you'd have to have a, a windowed cryostat which is what I've worked on and then you could sort of squint and just be able to see it uh, but compared to something that's normal you know a million times smaller than anything you could hope to see it's actually quite remarkable uh, and there's some very important um, practical applications for Joseph's injunctions which is I suspect the other reason that they gave the prize out uh, to this year for that uh, is because um, there's a lot of quantum computing architectures that are dependent on something called a superconducting quantum interface device which is one of those things that uh, this acronym does make sense um, because the uh, it's it's uh, just a pair of Joseph's injunctions arranged in a uh, sort of loop like this, right? And so the quantum interface part is the, the Joseph's injunction, uh, right? And then the superconducting part is, again, there's a superconductor and then interface device because... You know, again, there's an interface, and it's a device made out of the interface between a superconductor and a non-superconductor, uh, and it relies on quantum mechanics. But of course, you know they chose those letters in that order because that way it says squid, which, you know, is a, a sort of rolls off the tongue, and also it's just kind of funny. Uh, so a, a superconducting quantum interface device, or a squid, is a pair of Joseph's injunctions arranged on either side of a loop like this, and the symbol phi in the middle stands for magnetic flux. And these devices are special because they can be used for a lot of purposes, uh, but one of those purposes is for extremely sensitive magnetic field measurements, because there are certain properties of quantum mechanics that make it so that inside of this uh, closed loop with two Joseph's injunctions, right, we have that quantum tunneling phenomenon I was describing happening on, on both of these Joseph's injunctions, but because of the sort of weirdness of quantum mechanics, it works out that the 
voltage and the current that uh, you read through this Joseph's injunction, uh, sort of this just this loop of two Joseph's injunctions, it depends on the magnetic field uh, in the amount amount of magnetic flux, which magnetic flux is the amount of magnetic field passing through an area. So it's basically the, the magnetic field uh, multiplied by the area of this little loop here would be the magnetic flux, basically. And as the magnetic flux increases, the voltage and current change in a very special way where they basically, they don't, it doesn't go up in like a sort of smooth increment. It goes up in little jumps. And those little jumps uh, are sort of, uh, you can measure how many of those little jumps uh, you see. And based on that, you can come up with a very, very, very precise measurement of the strength of the magnetic field passing through the center of this loop. Um, that is not the only application for a squid. That's just the simplest, and though not, not necessarily the simplest, that's the, the first application for squids. Um, part of the reason that they're probably giving out this prize is that squids and Joseph's injunctions are generally considered the most promising candidate for a quantum computer. And there's a lot of reasons for that. They're not the only candidate by any stretch of the imagination, but generally they are the where most of the focus has been, um, because these are the most straightforward devices to actually fabricate and work with. Um, like any, uh, like anything, there's upside, there's, you know, there's different upsides and downsides of different architectures, but overall, uh, most attention has gone towards squids and uh, Joseph's injunction-based devices, uh, because they are the easiest to fabricate and interface with. Um, again, I won't get into all the minutia of what's good about them and what's bad about them, uh, but there is a reason that people tend to work on them, and it's mostly because we can actually make them. <laughs> uh, you know, other approaches have their upsides too, but they're a lot harder to make. Again, that is a vast oversimplification of something with a massive set of considerations. Um, so that's probably part of why they gave the prize to this, but it is very cool. Uh, and uh, there is a very meaningful sense in which it's taking this quantum mechanical phenomena that normally uh, happens at these extremely small uh, atomics, atomic or even nuclear scales uh, and bringing it up to a scale that is, you know, again, it's not like a huge length scale, but it's to a size where you actually can see it with your naked eye, which is, you know, pretty cool, uh, even if it has to be literally kept cool at sort of cryogenic temperatures uh, in order to operate. Um, so the exact details of Joseph's injunctions are pretty complicated. Uh, when you actually start looking at, uh, here's, you know, there's a, a simple description uh, of how the supercurrent actually flows through that gap. Um, I, I, I might talk about that in the future, um, but uh, suffice it to say, it's uh, it gets uh, it gets pretty hairy pretty fast. Uh, it's very interesting though, because uh, you talk about the way in which uh, quantum mechanical systems uh, sort of interact with one another and how this sort of uh, interference patterns build up um, between coherent quantum systems. So it's 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 pretty interesting. Uh, but yeah, so this is a, you know, a, a nice positive development for once. Uh, they do, you know, they announce the prizes every year, but I was very happy to see this one because this is something that I've, uh, I've uh, not, I've not worked specifically on the, uh, any of the stuff that this prize was awarded for, but I've, I've, uh, made contact with uh, a lot of this uh, and I've even met one of the one of the three recipients uh, we're not besties or anything but uh, he gave a talk once uh, that I attended so uh, yeah I definitely have uh, made a lot of contact with this uh, you know over the course of my career and I'm very happy to see the prize awarded for this because it's very it is very important work uh, and it's it's uh, to me at least extremely interesting so anyways uh, positive development for once at least <laughs>